All right, we're going live and hi, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, any anywhere you are, whoever is listening to this, I am so happy to be talking with you today. Oh my gosh, we have a good show for you today. I wanna to welcome you to Association Chat, an online discussion for the association community where we warm ourselves by the virtual fire with the topics of the day, welcoming thought leaders and trailblazers alike to join up in this online home for the community. I'm the host of Association Chat, Kiki Latalian, and this episode is maybe a little more timely than I ever anticipated, okay? Um, I'm about to interview, you are all about to listen to this interview with the co-CEOs of something called Arist. It's the first text message university which was named a finalist. I'm gonna ask you guys about this in a second. Named a finalist in Fast Company's 2019 World Changing Ideas competition that placed it as one of the top 20 most remarkable education focused innovations in the past year. The co-CEOs, Michael and Ryan, are here to answer your questions, answer my questions. I invited them here today to talk to us about Arist and its potential, where the idea came from, and the vision for the future. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so glad you guys are here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. thanks so much for having us. I'm thrilled to be here. So, of course, I said it's a timely discussion because right now, um, and depending on when listeners later are listening to this, uh, right now we are facing what's not been called a pandemic yet, but this whole coronavirus COVID-19 thing that um, is causing a lot of people worldwide to have to stay in and practice social distancing. And it's even having an impact on education. And today we're talking about Arist, which text-based education seems like it kind of goes with what we're talking about. So with that, why don't I go ahead and open it up to both of you and ask you to talk to us a little bit about what Arist is. Sure thing. Um, so Arist is the first text message learning platform. Um, so we help leading universities and companies uh, create and launch text message-based courses. Um, and so a text message course consists of 1,200 characters worth of text, so about two screen lengths worth of content, along with an image uh, and an assessment or links to additional resources, texted to users every single day over the course of anywhere from five to 30 days. And in anywhere from a 15 to 30 day course, we can cover a whole semester worth of course content uh, or an entire sexual harassment prevention course, an entire onboarding course, an entire culture course. Um, so, you know, we, we've seen it very, very recently be used more and more as a really great remote learning tool. But uh, the thing that we love about it is that because we deliver learning content directly to the user's phone or the user's WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, um, we make learning completely frictionless. Um, and so as a result, you know, we have course completion and satisfaction rates of over 90%, uh, which has been crazy. Uh, <laughs> people, people love getting a text, you know, an educational text every single morning. Um, and we find that for a lot of companies and organizations, it ends up being a really great way for them to teach their employees and, and members and students. So, Yeah. And um, when we spoke before, I know that uh, you had some pretty big goals for where you see Arist going. Can you guys speak a little bit about that? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So our goal is to deploy a million courses by the end of the year, um, wow. which is a pretty big, you know, scary goal. So, uh, but, but, you know, so we, we've, we've been, we launched a platform about five months ago and have been growing very, very quickly. Um, and the best part is that for every course that we, you know, that's that we deploy at a company or a so association or, or university, we donate one to one of our nonprofit partners to help a student in need. Um, and so far, we've been able to deploy courses in Mexico and uh, Kenya and Ghana uh, for a variety of different use cases. Now, see, we have a really great question. I want to get into um, talking about the uh, instructional design and a little bit about what goes into uh, making these courses work because you didn't go into this as let's just make a tech solution without uh, doing your research, you know? And so I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, but before I go into that, I do wanna touch on, you know, where the idea came from because I really love this story. And I think it, it can also inspire other people to think about 
um, ways that they can use it for their nonprofits and associations where maybe they hadn't thought about using it before. Yeah. Should you want to start with story? I can do instructional design. Okay, that's perfect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so my background is in the nonprofit space. Uh, when I was 15, I started a nonprofit called Tile.org, which today is the world's largest conversation series. We have about 450 locations in over 50 countries now. Um, and we, we provide you know live entrepreneurship-focused experiences all over the world. And one of our most successful locations was in the war zone in Yemen. And I couldn't understand why more students were coming to our events in Yemen than were coming to our events in Boston or Portland or New York. What I quickly, figu uh, quickly figured out was that Yemen's educational system has been broken for over four years. And so these events that we were hosting were the only educational resource that many students had. Um, and so I, you know, I started trying to figure out how to deliver more educational content to students in Yemen. And we very quickly started running into pretty significant barriers, right? So in Yemen, less than 24% of the country has access to high-speed internet, uh, mm -hmm. necessary for watching like a video course, for example. But almost everybody had access to a phone or WhatsApp. And so we figured out that if we could deliver learning content by a text message or WhatsApp, we could teach you know, thousands and thousands of students who currently don't have access to an education. Um, and so, you know, as, as a result, we, we started off with our social mission um, and it initially focused exclusively on, you know, helping students in need and has been scaled to, you know, other use cases of text message learning. But we still care deeply about, you know, the impact potential for this. Yeah, I love that. I, I you know, and it it really I think that that curiosity was fascinating to really pick up on because a lot of people would just say, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. We have more people who are logging in from there um, and participating, but why? It's the why, right? Yeah. So you find the answer and then you're like, okay, this is a great idea. Okay, Ryan, talk to me about instructional design. What goes into making this thing actually effective? Yeah, absolutely. So as Michael said, you know, the first thing we realized is, okay, we've got to somehow harness this different medium of learning. And then that kind of presented another huge challenge, which is how long should the courses be? How often should people get them? Should they be able to choose their time? What types of content are best? And so we spent a number of months running studies with universities like Babson College and UCLA and with students there and also running pilots within larger Fortune 100 organizations to figure out what types of content were best. Mm -hmm. um, as Michael mentioned, as far as the types of content, we've seen things like compliance training, uh, course reinforcement, culture and onboarding, and things around behavior change to be really effective. So we had a mindfulness course, for example, that um, is probably our top rated course of all time. And as far as actually creating those courses, you know, when we go into these learning designers, we work with these content creators, what I think a lot of folks forget if they're not on the course creation side is that it can take 40 to 80 hours and thousands of dollars to create a single hour of e-learning, of video-based e-learning. Um, within a corporate environment. And so that's not adaptable. Something changes, you can't really change it. And it's very expensive. And so for us, we'll go in there and we'll provide a set of content guides, frameworks, templates that will show you, here's how many characters, here's examples, uh, here's walkthroughs of us even just putting it into the platform. And here's our top recommendations as far as adding assessments to make sure people are following along. And everything we center around is make sure you're asking your users questions often to make sure they're following along and make sure you can keep that entire sound bite of learning to five to 10 minutes per day, because after that, that's when users stop paying attention. So it forces their creators to get to the point and it forces us to, to really take advantage of removing all those barriers to engagement. Well, you know, and it's fascinating because I, when I first discovered um, your platform and signed up to take a sample test, like, I mean, it was just, I was giving a presentation on bite-sized learning and I thought, hmm, I wonder what's out there for, you know, something, maybe there's something text-based I'm looking and I run across your website and I feel so fortunate that I signed up to, like, I really do. I think it was synchronicity at its best, you know, and also great SEO, but um, I, signed up for it and um, I signed up for an architecture, you know, it was intro to architecture, something like the architectural history. And um, it was amazing. I was like, I was really captured by it. I loved the way that I could choose what time of day I would get my reminders about the course when I, when I would be most likely to be able to take it. Um, I found that when it did ask me questions so that I could submit my responses, um, I, I became, and here's something, I became very curious to see like 
is there anybody reading it on the other side? What's happening when I submit my responses, you know? And um, I was looking forward to each day, you know, learning a little bit more, a little bit more. And so um, I have to say at the outset, I wasn't sure how it would work because I thought if it's too long, if it's too, but it was just the right amount. It was just the right amount for me to get that nugget of information and for it to stay in my mind. And so um, to that end, you know, what is the type of course material topics? What are the types of things that that fit really well into something like text based learning? Yeah, absolutely. And so the thing that we usually like to say to content creators is that it's really it's less about the subject. It's more about the depth of the subject. So, mm -hmm. so we like to use the classic example of we're not training surgeons to do surgery via text message, right? Not um, yet. <laughs> not yet. Not yet, at least. Uh, but, but what we really will push with them is for most introductory topics where you just need an introductory level, uh, a 101 on anything, um, text-based learning ends up working really well because often it's more about users understanding simple concepts and practicing those concepts than it actually is just giving them an incredible depth of, of a very specific subject. And so most of the courses that people will take online are to just get an introductory level knowledge on any subject, whether that's investing, whether that's architectural history, whether that's financial literacy, or whether that's something like mindfulness. And so for us, we really think message learning as capturing a lot of that, what I'd call 90% of, of learning online, which is that introductory learning into any subject for someone where it's their first time really interacting with that content. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. It, but, but it's interesting that you mentioned the architectural history course because that in and of itself was a challenge that we got, right? Because, you know, we, we had multiple people say, well, what is the limit of what you can teach with, with text messages? I'm sure you could never teach an architecture course with a text message. Um, and, and we were able to. Um, and what we find is that talented learning designers can do anything. It's just, you know, with, the difference is that with text message learning, you have to train yourself to teach less instead of, and, you know, and write less instead of writing more. So I have I have some really super smart people who are in this room right now who are watching live and um, dear, dear friend Jeffrey, um, who sends me amazing books occasionally when I'm really, really lucky, uh, who says, sounds like this would be very conducive to learning that involves right answers more than learning that is more subjective, interpretive, that kind of thing. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. So uh, with some learning, I would say yes, but, but not with all learning. And so for learning that involves right answers, you know, we've seen text used a lot for what I'd call pre and post work. And mm -hmm. so finding key terms ahead of time, making sure you, met, you remember different terms. What I will say is that the other thing we found to be really effective for, for things like public speaking, leadership, mindfulness, is habit building and habit forming. And so it's not just about giving a right answer. It's about keeping someone accountable for their goals. If every single day you get a text that says, here's how you can achieve this goal today, here's some tips and, and insights from experts, text back your top you know, insights for this day or what you're going to do today. And before you get the next text tomorrow, you have to go do X, Y, Z. And we've seen that incredibly effective. With our public speaking course, we challenged users on day one to go speak to three people on you know, the subway or the commute to work um, who are just random strangers and introduce themselves. We get some amazing responses with people saying, I'm so shy, I never get out of my shell. Okay, public speaking seems just a little bit easier because I can walk up to three strangers and it went phenomenally. And so for us, it's not just about right answers, but it's about at what point can you really make it effective to give someone that small interaction? And when users are choosing that time, it's really just up to the limits of your imagination of what you can do. Yeah, and I, I want to tell everyone who's actually watching this right now, you know, we were talking before everything started um, about the ability to show you a demo and kind of walk you through. And so um, because I don't want to disrupt that, because, you know, I don't want to accidentally like cut out our interviewees or anything like that. And for the fact that many people, most people actually listen to this as a podcast, audio podcast, um, I'm not going to have that here, but I do want to offer some kind of demo and I'm putting you guys on the spot, mm -hmm. some kind of demo on the associationchat.com website as a follow-up. So when I post the replay, maybe we can sync up and I can share that, um, with them. So, um, so to that point, I do have another question from someone who is all about team building. And of course, John Chen asks, what have you seen for team building with text? That's an interesting one. Okay. 
That's an awesome question. Um, yeah, so, so I think the number one team building use case we've seen is culture building. Um, so, you know, all teams struggle with culture. It's something that, that we, uh, you know, on our team, that we have just a small team of four or five people work on every single day. And something as simple as sending a five or 10 day course with your core values to reinforce your core values across your team. Um, you know, we find that for, for what one culture course that we ran um, was really successful. And in, you know, the post, the post course interview, one of the employees said that she just loved getting a reminder of why she worked at the company she worked for and what she, what the team and company stood for every single morning when she was on the subway. Even you know, just that little text, just that little nudge played a huge role in building a positive team culture and, and having a positive impact in, in team dynamics. Um, so so that, that's one of the most powerful use cases that we've seen. I think there's so much that can be done with it too, because um, I, I swear, you, anyone who's listening to this, I really do highly suggest that you sign up for one of their sample courses. I'm trying to actually get myself in gear so I can finish the one that I started creating for association chat, which is going to be amazing. But, um, you know, once you do it, and I'll say this, as soon as when you said that people look forward to that every day, it does create a habit. And in my own case, when I ended the course, I immediately wanted something else. I liked that bite sized learning that I was getting every day. So I overdid it. Like I signed up for a couple at once and I don't think that's the way I do it either. <laughs> it was it was exactly the perfect habit, adding that bit of learning every day, but I could totally see how I could design this, uh, you know, totally doable learning into those bits of time every single day and just this ongoing stream. It was really incredible how it did create that habit for me. And, you know, that I was really looking forward to the next thing. And so um, Jeffrey says, I'm excited about this potential and getting people to engage in behavior change that produces new habits is really great. However, that in and of itself is not technically learning. It's merely the first part of Kolb's experiential learning cycle, having the experience. Learning requires reflection, capturing insights learned, and then applying that learning over and over. Do these courses prompt people in that manner? Yeah, yep. absolutely. And, and so for the question, I would say we, we couldn't agree more. You know, in our content guides and templates, the thing that our content creators probably think we sound like a broken record on is we say, review, assess, get feedback, get feedback, assess, and it says it on every single page. And so if you're building in a behavior change course, we would like our creators to be constantly, not only asking users, how are you using this in your life, reflect on this, but to actually go through those answers in the dashboard and to reach out to these users and say, look, mm -hmm. like this really affected you. It seems like this changed your life. And, and these, you, while the learners are reflecting often, the creators can actually interact with them in that way and just say, look, we know that this is very powerful. How are you going to integrate this further? And then often what we've seen is at the end of the course, it'll require users or learners to make a plan of how going forward, they're going to continue that habit of trying something new or learning so that they can continue to learn themselves. Yeah, it's. Um, I thought that with the example of the architecture, our architectural history course, you know, there would be examples of um, learning a concept and then applying it to a picture and then, then interpreting it um, and applying it the way that, based on what you learned, how you would apply it to that structure that you were looking at. And then as a learner, I would be responding with what, you know, so this is how that reflects that concept. And um, I really, really enjoyed that piece of it because it did feel like it was doable, that it was, um, you know, it wasn't just, I wasn't going to do anything with that information, that I was applying it and I was having to then respond so that I really kind of grabbed hold of what that concept was. And so um, just fascinating stuff. And immediately I started thinking of how I could start using this in the teaching that I do and in the education that I do. I love that this exists. So to that end, so I asked you, I asked you about 
you know, some of the concepts be behind like how it was created and how, you know, how you're putting it together. What are the challenges that you're facing right now? Like, I imagine that it's hard when there are so many different directions you could go and there are so many different ideas. Like, how are you deciding what to do now? And what are some of the challenges that you're facing? Yeah, I, I think I think you hit the nail on the head. Like the biggest challenge we're facing is is figuring out exactly where to start off with text message learning because you know we, we've seen use cases ranging from authors using this to reinforce their books and conferences using this to reinforce the conference experience um, to you know to to corporate tons of different corporate training applications um, and sales training applications and community building applications. Um, and so for us, you know, we're, we're just trying to figure out where is that one place where we can just focus all of our energy to start and then and then spread from there. Um, so, so I think that that's been our biggest challenge. And I think also, you know, there's a natural skepticism that people have when it comes to text message learning. Um, you know, I, I remember telling one of my professors about about it and he was like, that sounds like the most gimmicky idea ever. Uh, and then for the course, you know, and then, and then two weeks later, I came to, came to this office, and he was like, "I get it. Like, I I get it. That was actually really cool." And so, um, and, and so, I think you know, getting over the skepticism barrier has been a little bit difficult. But the awesome thing is that once people take a course, they instantly understand the power of the media. And and we we are also based on you know behavioral science research from Stanford and UPenn, um, and so that definitely helps in terms of you know the, the skepticism barrier. I know that you gave me access, um, thank you, early on to a white paper that had been developed. Is that available for people, um, the public at large? Can I share that or how can we um, share that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can share it if you'd like and it's actually for free right on our website. If they just okay, go good. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Reed says, can you give us an overview of how the content creators work with the platform? Oh, you guys, this is amazing because I actually got to see their old dashboard for creators and their new dashboard for creators. So um, go ahead and talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a few different options in the new dashboard. And, and by the way, Kiki, I'm glad you've seen the old one because the new one, we don't even have to give people demos anymore. They just can, can kind of find their way around. Um, you basically will go into the course builder and you have the option to, you know, in, in your own white label, we call them classrooms, which is just a subdomain with your organization's logo and name on it. Um, you can input content day by day. And so you'll see an interface where you can add subsequent days, add a subject message, a body message, and you'll see on the side there are templates of here's how you break up that 1200 characters based on if this is a review day or it's a concept introduction day, here's how our experts would break it up. And then at the bottom, you also have the option to add a media file, like an image, if you want to include a diagram, and then an assessment question. And so for content creators, they can go in, add an open-ended, short answer, multiple choice question. And the best part is they can actually both set a correct answer that the system will record and keep an answer accuracy rate track. And additionally, they can also set a custom response. And so even if you've got, you know, let's say a case study explanation in a day and you send an open-ended response question of what would you do in this scenario, the learner can immediately, if you're training a thousand people at once, get a response with, here's the top three things our experts would do in this situation. So they know right away if they're correct and how they can improve for next time. And the cool part is that we've seen people build courses in as little as like two hours. It's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> It is super easy to spin up and to get going. I mean, I have to say, if you just say, okay, I want to do this right now and you allocate the time, it's totally possible. You can totally just sit there and do it. You've got everything you need. Uh, Jeffrey says, for what it's worth, I know I have colleagues who might initially react negatively with the emphasis on text since it leads with the technology, but they would be excited about snack size content delivery or some more artful phrasing than that. Reed says, cool, yes. Um, yeah, you know, it's interesting because there is that that skepticism that comes back that sort of, um, it is uh, almost knee-jerk response to, is it gimmicky? Is this something that just because the technology is there um, is being offered? And I think, I think in other hands, you know, and this speaks to the way that you've approached it, I think in other hands when people were just, this is a good idea, and I want to see it be successful and get garner a lot of attention. Um, it, it it could have been that way, but you really have done your homework and your research, and and it 
is coming together so nicely, so nicely, in fact, that you've been getting a lot of attention. So you have been winning awards, you've been recognized, you've been invited to go to South by Southwest. Talk to us about that. So, so what's happening now with Arist? You've been invited to South by Southwest. So far, it's still going on and it's about to happen. Like what, on the 12th or something is when it starts? Are you still going? What, what's happening with all of that? Yeah, uh, right now our plan is to go, uh, but we everything is sort of up in the air uh, because we, you know, already Google, Facebook, and a few other companies have pulled out of the event, and uh, we're not we're not sure what's going to happen. We're not sure if the event is, is still going to take place. Uh, we, you know, we we'd love to share. We're we're we're, pre we're you know presenting and pitching Aris, um, and we'd love the opportunity to share what we've been working on. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's everything is sort of up in the air, and and for us, you know, it's a little scary because. We've been invited to speak at a number of learning conferences over the next few months, um, and you know, and all of these really, really great conferences for all these really great communities that could benefit from from what we're doing. Um, you know, we're we're wondering if we'll be able to to share our work, um, and so it's everything's sort of up in the air. Yeah, it's strange because on the timing side of it, it seems. Um... It seems like this is a time when people would want to know more about what you're offering and need to know more about what you're offering. And yet it's a really horrible time to like have to go to meetings with like gatherings where people are bringing in their social, like their connections <laughs> instead of when we're supposed to be practicing social distancing. So, um, so what happens then as far as if you do have to I don't know. Are you going to try to, you know, work out virtually with with the planners, or how are you approaching that? Yeah, we're we're we're, we're honestly not sure yet. Uh, yeah, there's a chance that you know we think there might be a chance to, that the competition uh, portion of, of stuff that stuff us may be held online, where we just submit video presentations. Um, you know, we could we could see that working out, um, but it's just you know we're we're just not sure. And then one thing I will add too is that, you know, while we see this as a big challenge with conferences being canceled, we do of course also see it as, I wouldn't even say an opportunity, I'd say as a duty to a company like ours because we yeah. communicate more folks through a medium like text message learning, we're keeping them safer. And so our team internally is actually developing a course on the coronavirus this week um, that we'll be releasing to organizations and to schools either for free or very heavily discounted just to make sure Okay, wait, hold the phones. Okay, so you're putting together a course on the coronavirus this week, I imagine for how to handle it or how to navigate it, uh, that you're releasing for people. Oh my gosh, you guys, you know that I'm gonna have to share this with everybody in association chat. <laughs> um, that is fantastic uh, that you're going to be able to put that out. That's really, really, valuable for folks right now and really wise and a good chance for them to check that out. Um, a great argument for why something like this exists too. So I have to say kudos to you on the way that you've, you know, figured out how to navigate a very difficult situation. Um, you know, when you were talking about the, the course creators, the content creators, and some of the things that you're leading them to do and guiding them to do to get the best kind of um, course and, and outcome mm -hmm. for each one of these things that, that are available. What has been maybe a surprise that you've run into or something that you've discovered along the way that maybe you didn't anticipate in the beginning? Yeah, absolutely. And so I think for us, what we thought would be the most challenging thing in the beginning would be to get folks to actually trim down their content into just a small soundbite. What we've been really surprised at is, is really the ability of instructional designers who are typically writing courses that are 10 to 50 times as long um, and their ability to actually succinctly describe concepts. We thought we would need to give them far more help than we've actually had to. And that's because what we've learned from chatting with a lot of folks is often they've got in their head the spark notes on here's the most simple things people need to know, here's the way they need to know it. But often we've kind of been caught in this idea in e-learning and in just traditional learning in general where we need to be more verbose and give more detail and all these things that folks aren't going to remember when in reality, you know, 90% of that content you get in that one-time interaction, you're going to forget by the commute home. Yeah. And so we've actually just been so surprised by instructional designers, some of whom have never even developed learning for microlearning at all, let alone text message-based learning, which we sometimes consider super microlearning. Yeah. Uh, and, and just how easy that is for them because it's almost natural to just 
give something in a small soundbite in a simple way like you would in conversation as opposed to writing something very long form that we just do not have the attention spans to read or to watch. I mean, I do love that it, it does allow you to just talk about a very simple, con one concept, one major point, and it gives people the space to mull it over for 24 hours and then come back to it the next day. And I think that that, that space, that room is really beautiful for building that in because it, it controls the way people like me who might like, there's also this practice of binge watching and like, you know, where we can't hardly help ourselves. We're like, oh, I can, I can fit in five more of these, you know? And that sort of spacing it out so that you're taking the time to process and really absorb that information. I, I love that. I think that it was, for me, that works really, really well because it forces me to slow down, you know? Yeah. Have you, yeah, I was gonna say, have you, so as far as the feedback from learners, I know that you have been getting a lot of feedback. Um, what are some of the things that you're hearing? Has it changed the way that you may be in the beginning set out to, you know, create this product and further develop the platform? Yeah, honestly, I think at the beginning, we were as skeptical as everybody else. Uh, <laughs> and so for us, you know, we, we weren't sure if the data would, you know, we, we had this hypothesis of, of how we thought that people should learn and how we thought we could utilize this technology. And, um, and you know, we wanted to see if our hypothesis held up. Um, and, and it's been phenomenal because, because all, you know, at this point, over 2,000 people have taken an ARIS course and our hypothesis has been held up. You know, we find that there is a small portion of people you know, five to ten percent of users who, you know, just hate text message learning, and there's nothing yeah. you can do about it. Um, but but what we found is that you know the vast majority of users, ninety plus percent of users, absolutely love it. And the most interesting thing is that we initially thought that this would be a great tool for you know Gen Z and millennial users, and we were scared that you know users over the age of fifty might not like text message learning as much. Uh, and we've been proven wrong completely. We we actually find that users over the age of fifty like getting their daily text message much more in some cases than Gen Z and millennial users. It's really? Oh my gosh. And the reason why we think is because it's oftentimes so much simpler than having to log on to a video platform and, you know, either download learning content or load, you know, a whole video course. It's just, you know, everybody gets a text from either their spouse or their kids or their parents or their friends. Um, and so it's such a natural and frictionless learning medium that an even intimate medium. an intimate medium as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that that people of all ages and of all backgrounds like it, which which we've been thrilled by. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have to say that um, I've been sort of oddly protective of thinking about the future for this for you for you, because I think right now you know, you're competing with a text from my husband and maybe an occasional like prodding to go vote when in the upcoming election, but there's really not a whole lot of competition there. And I'm like, oh, you know, I like that there's this controlled um, way that I'm receiving this information. I hope not too many other things compete with this in the future. Have you heard that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so the, the biggest thing, we really are the first text message learning platform. We, we've searched far and wide. And I think the biggest thing right now are there's two categories of substitutes. The first is what a lot of text messages are currently used for, which is mm -hmm. en masse marketing, one-to-one -one communication, um, and, and really just kind of one-to-many single text. And so for that, a lot of users feel spammed. They don't enjoy the experience. I don't want TJ Maxx telling me there's a 40% offset. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and then in learning environments, the substitutes people are learning are email courses and micro learning apps, which have completion rates of anywhere from five to at the best 15%, because mm -hmm. they're not removing a lot of those barriers to engagement, everything from logging in to being lost in a sea of other emails that, that other meetings might have. And so for us, it's really about how do we kind of lead the, lead the research around how this is an effective learning medium, what types of content is best for it, but then also duly, how do we partner with the top organizations that are going to help get that widespread adoption of text message learning. Yes, I think that you know every every great facilitator and organization that I know that provides learning should be thinking about this and looking at this. Jeffrey, to that 
To that point, Jeffrey says, I could get very excited about using this approach to facilitate learning before and after an actual in-person learning experience as well. Yeah, think about all the times that you have a board that needs to do their homework ahead of time and they don't. They don't. Yeah. But what if they knew the key points ahead of time? What if it was you're, you're just sort of feeding them along the way so that they have those key things that they're thinking about? Maybe pre-session questions or something like that um, where they can at least be mulling things over before they actually get in the room for a more intentional, like uh, focused block of time where they're learning something that is more in depth maybe um, and more intricate. I have another question over here from John who says, what's your best success story and maybe didn't work story, <laughs> the maybe failure story, we won't call it failure, you know, we're always learning, that you have from implementing. Yeah, uh, it's, it's gonna be tough to choose the success story, I'm gonna be honest. Uh, I think we just ran a course uh, with a large multinational company um, that makes wind turbines amongst a number of other things. Um, and they, they ran a course for about 50 of their employees. Actually, you, you led this pilot. So if you want to talk more about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so for us, you know, for, for this organization, what they really wanted to do, it kind of goes back to your idea around course reinforcement, um, is they actually went in, did this big learning with a bunch of their folks, and then, you know, would survey them after this. It was a one-time workshop. It was a big interactive seminar. They spent thousands of dollars doing this. And after the fact, they found that learners couldn't retain almost any of the information. Um, and, and, you know, when you quiz someone 10 yeah. days, add it and there's really no interaction for a few dollars per person to add that text message course, which was less than an additional 1% of what they'd spend that went up to about 85% in what people remembered after the fact. Um, and they had a really intensive seminar on financial markets and a bunch of different things. And they were asking users to describe companies, describe the analysis they had of these organizations. And people would respond in very long form. You know, you, you think text learning, you think people just want to respond with like a multiple choice answer. We got some amazing responses. And for this organization, that data otherwise would have cost them thousands of dollars just to collect, not even counting in the time that you've got managers pounding people to give those responses, right? Mm -hmm. So for us, it really proved FCT in the medium itself because for almost no cost, they could get this amazing treasure trove of data, both in responses and in the frequency of those responses. Wow, that is, that's really fascinating. What an interesting use case and example that that's amazing. Um, okay, so I want to go ahead and talk a little bit about you, you both are working together as co CEOs on this, the challenge of navigating an exciting business as leaders, <laughs> working together, there have to be times when, you know, you're having these discussions and thinking, are we ready for this? Are we ready for what's about to happen? And what does this mean for, I mean, I think about the interpersonal dynamics um, of anything, of any group, and it just has to be, you know, really exciting and intense also at the same time. So what's it like when you're working together, you know, what are some of the things that you're figuring out along the way about how to make that team sort of function really well and making sure that you keep that relationship going strong? Yeah, no, excellent question. Um, well, for, first off, like I love, I love the team that I get to work with. I, I love Ryan. I love Maxine and Joe, uh, our, you know, our other two team members. Um, we have an incredible network of mentors and advisors that have been super, super supportive and, and give us tons of feedback and advice. Um, so I think we, we've just been really, really lucky in terms of, you know, the, like the phenomenal people that we that, that we get to be around. Um, and, you know, Ryan and I are, are carbon copies of each other. We, we, we even get mistaken for brothers sometimes. So um, we like I can always count on Ryan to, to you know, if, if I can't make a meeting, he can he can pick it up. If, if, if you know, if Ryan can't make a meeting, I can pick it up. Um, and, and then, you know, we just we communicate clearly all the time. Um, and have clear guidelines for, for communication and, and for decision making. Um, and, and our goal as well is just to move quickly. 
Um, and so we, we, we have an immense level of trust for each other to, to ensure that we can make decisions quickly and, and move forward in the most efficient manner possible. One thing I, I will add to that is, you know, microfilms are carbon copies of each other. And I think in terms of, you know, the vision that we have and the skills that we're able to portray with selling, for example, and with working with partners, that's very true. But I think that one reason that we work so well together is because we also have incredibly complementary skill sets. Uh, Michael is very much the optimist of the team. I am very much the realist. <laughs> You know, he's very good at kind of, here's the broad vision, let's go, go, go. And I have more of the operational mind. Here's kind of the step-by-step -step to build the organization under that. And so I think that in any team, that's what's really needed is that can you cover each other's strengths and weaknesses, sure. But even further than that, can you have what I call the balancing energy between one another? Do you have someone who is very optimistic and can lead the charge? And do you have someone who can kind of get all those pieces together to make sure that charge doesn't get pulled back, you know? And so I think that those are often the most important components. And so many small teams will, will focus their energy on product or on revenue numbers. And for us, by putting energy and getting energy from the people you work with, that's, that's kind of something that won't burn out. Yeah, I, you know, I'm very thankful that you have each other, that you have such a great team that is working on something that I think is really transformative, transformational for everyone. I mean, I, you know, I would say the meetings industry and the association industry and those industries that I'm tapped into in particular, but as you know, there's an association and a nonprofit for everything. And um, I really do see this as something that can have an incredible impact around the world. And so um, it is good to see and hear that this is well thought out. And this is a solution that is um, something that is backed by people who are able to, you know, come together as a team and work so well together. When you think about, um, so there are two questions I have and they're more business minded. One is you are both incredibly gracious and um, wonderful to work with. I mean, I have to say that, um, and I've talked with Michael before with his time and his, I know that he's so, busy. I know you both are so busy. Um, always been very responsive. And, um, you know, I think how, so the first question is, when you have so many people who like me, ah, like me, obviously know that there is great value, and there is something really amazing that they can do with this. How do you gauge, um, you know, who to spend your time with, because you can't do that with everyone. And well, I'll ask you that question, and let you answer it. And then I'll ask my my second question. Sure thing. Uh, for, for, for us, we, we care deeply about our customers. And it doesn't matter if it's a small three person, you know, restaurant in northern Michigan, or or if it's, you know, Geico or, or some huge company, um, we, we treat everybody the same. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and we, we dedicate uh, an immense portion of our, of our day uh, communicating with customers and ensuring that, you know, using the platform is easy to ensure that their courses are, are as great as they can be. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's a core value of our company. And um, we're, you know, we, we, we have a policy across our entire team that if a customer needs something, we will drop everything and take care of it. Um, and, and, you know, so, so far, we, we've been able to service every customer request within hours. Um, and as, as you know, customers grow, we, we will need to start hiring more and more people, but we just, um, you know, for, for us, the customer always comes first. And, so. and if I can just add quickly too, the thing you're probably thinking is, you know, that sounds really great, but how does that kind of scale and, and how does that even work? You know, for us, again, shout out to Joe and Maxine and, and our incredible team. Um, there's a natural simplicity built into a lot of what we're doing. And we spend an insane amount of time making sure that everything from navigating the platform to receiving those texts to signing up is as simple and as frictionless as possible. And a lot of the customer service requests we end up answering are what else can I use this for? And it's a much yeah. more conversation to have than asking, you know, I've, I've had, I've, I've used software like everyone else and you go on customer support and you get a 1-800 number and you can't get it working. Yeah. By removing all of those sort of points of friction, um, we can devote to what Michael talked about a lot of our time to really having the conversations that matter. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I, I do have a feeling that this is your like one of the best kept secrets type of thing right now, and that's about to explode. Um, so that was my next question, which had to do with scaling. Um, you know, this is a struggle. This is a challenge for 
every type of business that's out there that wants to be profitable and grow. It's it's a challenge for a lot of people who have a great culture, uh, great corporate culture, great uh, group of people, and have to figure out how to expand that too. So, you know, you have this beautiful thing. Are you a little nervous about those next steps with, with growing it and how you're going to you know, find those team members that are the right team members and where, what happens next? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we, we, we are a little bit scared of, I mean, we, we know that these next few months are going to be simultaneously amazing, uh, you know, as, cause you know, we, we, we just, we, we actually are just opening up our platform to the public. Um, we, we just, you know, in the past two weeks have started, you know, l letting more and more people, uh, use Eris. And, um, and and so we know that over the you know we we we've, we've signed up I think seventy organizations in the past like week, uh, yeah. and we know that that's just going to continue to to take off over the next few months, um, and so we're a little bit scared of it. But we you know we also as as Ryan mentioned previously a lot of we, we, you know we've spent the past few months just refining our processes for bringing on new clients and for servicing new clients and for ensuring that the customer experience is fantastic. Um, and and we're, we're constantly releasing new tools and processes to ensure that that, that, that we can scale. Um, so, you know, it's going to be a fun ride. Without a, <laughs> uh, but, but we, you know, j just the, the thought of, of thousands, thousands more people using text message courses and, and learning more effectively and actually remembering the stuff that they need to learn, um, you know, that, that, that's, uh, it, it drives us a lot and it's a pretty compelling mission to, to work behind. Yeah, I, I'm really excited about my first course coming out for association chat and then seeing the other courses that are going to come out through it um, using Arist. Uh, I do want to remind everyone who, I guess maybe not remind, I have to tell you the first time, right, before I can remind you, there are some polls. I'm very interested in seeing what your responses are. Um, I have uh, three questions on one poll. And that is, do you have courses that could be adapted to course by text? Do you currently have courses or content that could be adapted to course by text? Yes or no? How likely would you take a course by text? Likely or not likely? And would you like to know when Association Chat's course by text is available? Yes or no. Place your votes now. I have a record of it. And I'll, I'll let you know right now that we have 75% have voted yes, that they do have courses or material that could be adapted to course by text. We have 66.7% who say that they would be likely to take a course by text. And we have 66.7% who say that they would want to know when Association Chat's course by text is available. So that's exciting to see. <laughs> You'll be hearing about that soon. So before we go, um, is there anything that you'd like to let people know um, that we haven't covered today or that you think is exciting on the horizon? Something that you wanna let people know in this audience uh, about Arist and what, what your plans are for the future? Sure, I think probably the main the main point is um, creating courses is so much easier than you think, mm -hmm. um, and we, we would love to help um, you know uh, run any experiments or, or, or pilots um, with with any course content that you have because we, we just think that that you know it's it's worth the shot, um, and once you actually give it a try, you'll you'll find that um, that it, it's just a lot easier than, than you would imagine. Our goal is to make this the easiest course you'll ever build, um, and also the funnest course you'll ever take. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that, that that's sort of the last point. And, and I think in general, um, you know, there's opportunities for, for change and opportunities for innovation everywhere. Um, and we, you know, coming from a nonprofit background, the work that associations do is so incredibly important. Um, and, and, you know, oftentimes in, in, in difficult times, right, communities are, are where we go for support and, and associations are where we go for support. Um, so yeah, you know we're, we're we're super grateful for the work that you do, um, and can't wait to to be a part of of making your work as great as it can be. So oh, I love you. Sorry, I cut you off, Ryan. <laughs> no, you're all good. I couldn't have said it better myself. Oh, I love you guys so much. I love what you're doing. Thanks to everyone who's watching this right now. Um, really quickly, if they want to reach out to you, if they want to find out more, where can they go? 
Absolutely. So right on our website on Aris.co, uh, there's an option to request a demo. If folks would like a demo. Additionally, our emails are just Ryan at Aris.co and Michael at Aris.co, A-R-I-S-T dot C-O. Um, like we said, we are incredibly responsive and, and always love chatting to users and potential users. So feel, feel free to reach out to us anytime. I love it. Please, please, everyone, uh, wherever you are, if you're in your office, if you're in your home, maybe not if you're driving, but wherever you're listening to this, give them a round of applause. Give them a psychic round of applause because this was an incredible interview. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. And thanks to everyone today who tuned in and listened to, to participate in this live. Um, I hope you learned something helpful that you'll be able to use in your work life and maybe even in your personal life as you're taking these courses and really experiencing uh, learning in a new way. Until next time, everyone, keep asking questions to learn every day. As Joseph Campbell once said, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Have a great rest of the week and weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.